But we've been asked today to um, talk about wearable technology. Um, and so we're going to take you through some of the trends that we see taking place in the marketplace. So just to give you a little bit of context, a little bit of a background about PSFK, we're a daily news site. We share ideas 20, 25 times a day about all sorts of change, progressive change that we see, whether it's in storytelling, technology, design. Uh, we share those ideas. And um, alongside that, we also provide these reports. We've, we've uh, written reports about retail, about health, uh, and most recently about wearable tech. In fact, uh, Intel uh, underwrote the report and uh, supported the work. Yeah, and just uh, to give you a little sense of how we actually get to the ideas that we're going to be presenting today, um, whether we're working with a private client like Apple or BMW, or in this case, Intel to publish um, the work that we're going to be sharing today, we essentially start with a uh, research brief, go out and gather a lot of interesting ideas uh, that sort of speak to that space, and then we do pattern recognition against that to identify where these sort of emerging ideas are are coming and we'll showcase uh, a number, 10 trends today, along with a number of innovative examples that show how that's manifesting within the marketplace. Cool. So who is wearing a wearable technology device? Yeah, two or three people. Today, most of you are probably holding, uh, have a wristband, you use wristband as a, a piece of technology. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about how we see the space evolving. Um, and we're going to talk about the trends, as Scott said. Um, and today, yeah, a lot, of the, a lot of the activity is taking place in the, with the wristband. So we all have our jawbones, our Nikes, um, and other Fitbit, uh, with the Fitbits. Um, and in the report, which, which is available for free, you can download it, um, we talk about the different functions that, the, that are going to evolve across the different types of format. Today, this year, next year, we're going to see a lot of um, the wristband kind of uh, leading the sort of wearable uh, push. But we'll see other things begin to take place. Jewelry is going to become an important part um, of the ecosystem. And we're going to see that kind of evolve over the next couple of years. In terms of glasses, what we see from the results that we have is it will have an important, uh, it'll, there'll be an important element. So it will actually um, have... Um, offer some functionality, but it won't offer, glasses won't offer all the different types of things that we see different formats uh, offer. Later on, we're going to see clothing be more involved, become mainstream, digital clothing, wearable clothing. Um, and probably by 2017, 2018, we'll start to see early adopters really begin to play with um, uh, embeddable technology an implantable technology, or it could be just technology that you stick to your skin, semi-permanent, or it can be technology that you actually begin to enter underneath your skin. And we can talk about that a little bit as well. So we'll talk a little bit about the trends and talk about the big ideas that we see taking place. So this hopefully uh, beautiful chart here um, shows three of the, the big ideas that we're tracking in this space. And really the way that we've, we've sort of uh, looked at this is from the context of how that changes uh, our relationship with other people. And so we're calling that theme connected intimacy. So these new wearable devices are starting to create a truer picture of ourselves, help us broadcast that out to our loved ones and the wider community, and really um, share information in a more intimate fashion. Uh, the second notion is really that relationship that we have with our technology in our, in our own lives. And that's what we're calling the tailored ecosystem. And really what we're starting to see as um, these devices become more of a commonplace part of our lives, gather intimate details about who we are, our behaviors, what we're doing, we're going to start to see a, a real level of personalization begin to occur and particularly as they begin to interact with other connected uh, devices and ecosystems as well. And then the final notion is really sort of getting out to, as Piers sort of touched on, this, this sort of cyborg or, or 
human tech fusion that we're starting to see, which is this co-evolved possibilities of when these devices are actually not something that we take on and take off, but begin to be something that are um, embedded or integrated in our bodies in new ways. And that's either to gather new pieces of data and information in a 24-7 context, or even begin to augment the sort of natural human abilities that we have. And so again, this, within this first section, we're really going to look at this, this sort of person-to-person -person relationship and how these new technologies are beginning to drive uh, a, new, a new way of communicating with other people and just the way that we present ourselves to the wider, the wider world. Sure. So the first trend that we're going to take you through is this idea of uh, long distance togetherness. And we look at how wearables is driving uh, uh, connectedness with loved ones over great distances. Often this has been fueled by haptic feedback. It's and it's, it's, it's really this new sort of um, emerging form of communication. In some ways, it's a lighter form of communication. It's nonverbal, but it's, it's sort of that shared awareness that begins to uh, bridge any distance. Whoops. So this um, first example is... Um, sorry, sorry about that. I'm going to talk over it. Go for uh, it. This first example is about... Uh, it's a wearable shirt. It's a... Um, is a sweater that actually is being designed for um, an autistic child. And um, uh, it basically can be communicated with by a parent or loved one or a caregiver and actually can um, create pressure uh, within, the, within, the, within the sweater. And it will basically be used kind of as a calming mechanism. Yeah, and the, the idea here is that uh, children with autism tend to have problems with human contact. Um, it can be disorienting for them in a lot of ways. And this jacket is meant to sort of bridge that gap, share that level of comfort that something like a hug is able to, to provide, but at a, at a level that's a little bit more comfortable for these children. Um, down the road, hopefully this doesn't replace uh, just sort of regular parenting so that you can be at the bar and just be remotely <laughs> hugging your child goodnight. But who knows? We, we, we shall see. The, uh, the second example here is something that is sort of bridges that gap between communication and connection as well as sort of adding a level of entertainment as well. Um, this is something called the alert shirt and actually this woman, uh, Billy uh, Whitehouse, Billy Whitehouse uh, spoke at our conference in April and she does a lot of experiments with wearable technology. In this instance, she's designed a, a shirt that can be worn by Australian uh, football players. Uh, it connects with a sort of parallel shirt that any of, any of you can wear, essentially, and it allows you to experience what the players are, um, are going through on the pitch, so to speak. You feel what they're feeling. So um, all that excitement can be generated through various haptic, haptic sensors. Um, the big hit that comes, all that sort of adds a, a deeper element to that whole entertainment experience and the way that you sort of connect with these uh, athletes. Uh, the second trend that we're going to talk about is this idea of data streamed care and how um, wearables is gathering, is able to gather uh, vital signs which can be sent to loved ones, can be sent to um, caregivers. So in the same way, all of these personal devices that we're wearing now are able to start capturing different levels of health metrics and, and, and medical data and sort of sharing that to your mobile device. Um, the next level will be sort of streaming that in real time to an expert or a loved one to provide that sort of uh, immediate level of feedback about your own personal health. Um. So this is a onesie. I don't know if there are any parents in the audience who look so young, but maybe one or two. And uh, if you are the first time parent, uh, you are absolutely paranoid about your small child, the, th the new thing that you've been given. And for, you forever like go and check on the baby, make sure they're breathing. Um, the second child gets none of that. Um, 
So uh, if you're a second child, you understand like your parents' relationship with you. It's like, it's okay, they're chill. First, so um, uh, Mimo is basically a device that, as you can see, has a wearable packet. Looks a little bit uncomfortable. Uh, but it has, um, it can register things such as temperature, heartbeat, movement, I think. Um, and it can re obviously uh, report that back to um, the phone. But it also has a novel sort of uh, connectivity aspect to it in the fact that it actually um, sends and transmits this data to a, a cup. Uh, so basically as a cup, as you can see, coming through. And it gives you a nice smiley face if the kid is happy, content, and then gives you a nice frowny face if the kid's upset. You'd probably hear if the kid's upset first, but just in case, just in case you have your headphones on or something. So, th so this is another one in that sub-trend of absentee parenting. <laughs> um, but I think, I think this could be um, you know, terrifying in some ways, but the idea is, is that it's meant to sort of help you really feel deeper connection to your child and, and understand on a, on a more, uh, on a deeper level um, what they're experiencing so that you can provide a, a better level of care. As, as Piers mentioned earlier, we're, we're starting to sort of move in this direction of these sort of always on wearable devices that are getting closer and closer to our, our sort of human skin. Um, this is, uh, this is an origami medical patch developed by Northwestern University. And the idea here is this, uh, this device or patch um, adheres to the skin. It has uh, flexible wiring built into it. So as you sort of, as you sort of move, um, it's able to bend and flex along with your natural, your natural movements. Um, and it has medical grade sensors in it um, such that it can provide uh, EE, EEG or EKG level uh, statistics that it can report out to a doctor. Um, the idea is, is that this could either be something that you wear all the time and is reporting that information out um, to a medical professional, or at the same time, it could be within a clinical setting, providing that same level of data but not having to be sort of confined to a bed or whatever the case is. We also saw a trend called emotion, which we are, we're labeling emotional mirror, about how wearables are um, providing information to people around us, uh, are helping us and the people around us understand the emotions, uh, the feelings of those people. Yeah, and just sort of as a as a, in aside, in the tech space, there's a lot that's happening now with that. Um, human emotion as a new level of input that's starting to communicate in different ways with devices and, and prompting a number of uh, different actions that are, that are happening. Um, this is a bit of a stunt, but it's a fun, it's a fun stunt and uh, it's one of the examples that we uncovered. But really this is about, um, uh, there's these, this wonderful uh, London, London organization called Technology Will Save Us. Anybody heard of these guys? They're the guys who create Arduino kits and little uh, kits that you can buy. They're trying to introduce technology to the mainstream. Um, and one of their stunts was basically uh, uh, a raincoat that can, will react if you eat chocolate. So it's done for the brand Cadbury. It's a, a well-known chocolate brand in the UK. And basically, if you eat the chocolates, uh, a sensor, and I think a camera, watches you as you unwrap the piece of chocolate, and then the, the, the coat explodes. It about pops up, um, you get confetti, you have this LED lighting. It's a fun example, but again, it kind of, it's, it's this sort of mirror. It shows that it's trying to it, it demonstrate the emotion and the feeling of the wearer. This one arguably fits in that same sort of out there category, but for everyone who has to ride the L train or any subway uh, on a daily basis, you understand, especially in New York City, personal space is, is at such a premium. Um, and so this, the personal space dress is, has been designed to um, take that level of, of feeling like your personal space is being violated and then um, almost sort of like octopus tentacles begin to expand the, uh, 
the sort of bottom of the dress to provide a little bit of nonverbal communication about, hey, get out, of, get out of my space a little bit. You're getting a little too close. So again, um, you know, these, are, these two examples are pretty playful, but um, you can imagine how this might sort of manifest in the sense of um, you know, coupling that with the data stream care example where if you're in a bad mood, maybe um, your device starts to send alerts to your sort of support network um, and really can, can begin to sort of ladder up some of these experiences together in new and interesting ways. So as we get to this, uh, as we get to this next big theme, again, we're, we're really going to look at that level of personalization and sort of connected experiences that are, that are being enabled by these wearable technologies. As they're gathering more intimate details about who we are, what our behaviors are, and, and really start to um, you know, offer a new level of experience. And then even within this section, we're also looking at um, not just the functionality of some of these devices, but the actual physical design. So as 3D printing technology becomes a little more mainstream, does that uh, take us to a level where some of the d these devices are actually modeled or, or created specifically for the, the, the own contours of our, of our own bodies? Mm -hmm. And I think we see that in this first trend. So uh, you know, you're a pretty savvy crowd and understand 3D printing, um, but maybe sometimes we don't think about 3D printing as a way to create wearables. And we're going to see this first, particularly in the, the medical space and the health space. So this example, Dextrous, is an open source uh, 3D printing uh, project designed to help particularly children at a very young age who um, might not have access to prosthetics, given the fact that they're constantly going through growth spurts, um, and they're outgrowing these very expensive uh, pieces of technology. So um, what they've done here is created a platform that allows, uh, you know, a, a very sort of basic but but fully functional uh, level of prosthetic that can be created, printed out at a very low cost, and uh, created for the individual. So if you can imagine, um, not only does this sort of lower the barriers for access to anyone in that context, but it also takes into consideration things like comfort as well as these um, are, are meant to fit more uh, appropriately to uh, each individual's own particular body. Um, and then we talk about um, this trend of biometrically attuned, about how the, um, these sensors in these, in these wearable devices um, are gathering information and then providing services as a result. So this, for this first example, we have Aristify, which is an MIT project. And basically, they've been looking at um, use of electro, electro, thermoelectric pulses to regulate your temperature. So essentially, the, uh, the sensors I, I see you're wrapping yourself up in your, your coat over there. So um, theoretically, we all could have our own sort of personalized heating and cooling that lives on our body. So what the device actually does is it senses uh, the body's core temperature, and then it can send out waveforms that um, heat and cool the body to sort of maintain a specific level of uh, temperature that theoretically is going to be more comfortable for. Does it trick the body? Or does it want? Yeah, I think it's. I think it, I think it sort of. I think it tricks and then regu and then regulates the yeah. body. So Nothing scary at all there. Okay. No. <laughs> um, and then we have responsive coaching, uh, which is about technology again monitoring uh, us, monitoring context, and then providing gentle pushes, gentle nudges uh, to uh, suggest better behavior. Yeah, so there's all, those, there's all those new habits that we wish that we could adopt, but there's a level of um, sort of motivation that's lacking, or it's just easier to go on living uh, 
your, your own sort of normal sluggish lifestyle or whatever the case might be. These technologies are really sort of looking at um, behaviors from diet to fitness uh, and providing a level of motivation and, uh, and nudge to remind us um, how to improve our behaviors. So the first, the first example here is all designed around posture. Um, this is a device called the LumoBack, which I think even since we produced this report has uh, updated the design to become a little bit more lower profile as well. Um, the idea here is that um, it's a wearable piece of technology that connects with your mobile device and it senses your posture throughout the day and as it, as it sees um, that you're slipping or you're slouching or whatever the case might be, it's able to send uh, little prompts that remind you in the same way that your mother might um, to sit up straight and actually begin to uh, changes over time. Eventually, you're, you're sort of learning to take on these new behaviors as opposed to having to be constantly reminded all yeah. the time. I think someone from the New York Times reviewed this. They wore it for a day and they hated it. Yeah, it buzzed them every 30 seconds, like, get up, stop, stop. This, this next example here is, again, sort of one of these new class of devices, and we're, getting, we're beginning to see that the, the ear is actually becoming an interesting place for a new level of uh, wearable technology advancement. In, the, in this context, um, this is called the LumaFit, so it's essentially a device that you wear over your ear and it has a sensor that clips onto your earlobe. Um, that enables it to gather um, information about your, uh, your heart rate uh, and your breathing. And again, it connects with uh, a wearable, a, a mobile device to provide uh, information about um, your breathing. So it's designed to help people um, lower their stress and focus on meditation. And as well, it can connect through with um, various fitness activities as well. Tracking, tracking those behaviors, it, it intuitively knows what exercises that you're doing, and that can provide real-time feedback about how to improve those behaviors as well. It's interesting that chart, which we've, yeah, that chart of uh, how technology is going to evolve over the next few years. Um, we didn't think about it so much. I don't know. It could be me, you. Um, we didn't think about ear, we should go back and maybe think about that. It's been so much innovation when it comes to the ear and wearable tech in the ear over the last six months. Uh, it's a really interesting space to watch. Yeah, and it's, it's sort of an interesting place because it has, um, there's a number of different signals that can easily be picked up. It's a low profile design, so it overcomes some of that, the challenges of something like a, a Google Glass or something that you're overtly wearing, so you don't necessarily have to make a fashion statement with uh, having something like that, that that sort of is hidden behind the ear in some ways. And as, as we move on to this next section, again, we're starting, we've, we've looked at that person-to-person -person relationship and then the person-to-technology, and now in some ways we're, we're moving in this direction of person-as-technology in some ways. Um, seeing at the, the new designs that are being more closely integrated and embedded on the body um, to begin offering a new level of uh, sort of co-evolution that's starting to happen. Okay. Uh, so I have a fly. I have new wearable tech. Um, so we talk about um, how technology can like, augment our experience can magnify experience, can uh, assist us, um, change how we perceive the world around us. So for this first trend, we call it augmented sensory perception. Um, and a lot of the medical field is kind of pushing this, helping people who are blind, people who are deaf, um, kind of see and hear better. And there's, there's also some interesting sort of, there's this emerging uh, sort of hacking, biohacking that's starting to take place with people actually experimenting with a lot of these um, sort of basement medical procedures on themselves in different ways, looking at how these sensors begin to offer them new sensations and new sensory perceptions. Um, so there's a lot of experimentation taking place in this space as well. 
in this instance, um, this is a this is a sort of concept or working prototype for a zoomable contact lens. So particularly for um, someone who might be aging that's starting to have macular degeneration, um, the idea behind this uh, contact is that it can zoom up to three times to provide uh, a level of not maybe returning sight um, back to 2020 vision, but starting to sort of um, go a step further in terms of giving mm -hmm. people the ability um, to regenerate some of their, their lost sight. Yeah, and so only recently they've been able to do this with the liquid crystals before the, the device would fall out of your eye or you can close your eye. And then we look at the, the idea of uh, technology and this wearable technology has been this sort of interface device. With this first example we're going to show you, it's um, uh, a wearable ex uh, designer from Brazil, Katia Vega. Vega, yeah. Um, who basically uses conductive uh, makeup, conductive ink, to uh, create circuitry here in a, kind of, in a fashion sense. But basically what she does is... Um, the, one of the things she does is she flies one of those, um, what do you call the drones? Drones. She basically flies a drone by blinking her eyes and closing, and let, uh, closing her eyes. And, and again, this is just sort of another one of those experiments. And more broadly, we're starting to see um, a, a wider spread adoption of these intuitive, more natural forms of interaction between individuals and their technologies. So gesture, so moving from touch to gesture, obviously voice becoming like a big, a big thing as well. So just really sort of lowering those barriers and changing the way that we interface with um, all of these different technologies. The second example that we want to showcase here is something called uh, the Nod, which is a wearable ring that's meant to bring a level of uh, gesture recognition to a much larger variety of connected technologies. Um, in this case, the device is worn on your is worn on your finger um, by there's there's a few buttons that exist on the device. By pressing those, that activates a level of gesture, so you can start to control things like your connected television um, and the. Uh, the bottom of it actually has a swipe interface as well. So as you sort of move your finger or thumb along alongside of that, that activates a, a different level of gestures as well. So it's really meant to be this sort of intuitive onboard interface that you have with you at all times, and it changes that relationship, whether it's in your office or in your home, and you have the ability to sort of have this hands-free interaction with a wider range of technologies. Um, and obviously, uh, privacy, passwords is a, a big issue. Uh, how we authenticate ourselves uh, becomes challenging. We've seen examples where wearable devices begin to kind of overcome some of the concerns and some of the uh, challenges. With this, with this first example from Nimi, this is basically a device, uh, uh, a wristband, which um, can check your... Uh, Heartbeat. Heartbeats, basically, and check your heartbeat. Apparently, correct me, we've all got individual heartbeats. The cadence, the rhythm, the frequency uh, changes. And so as a fa because of that, uh, this device can uh, listen to your heartbeat and can basically unlock things. could unlock your computer. One day it can unlock a door. Yeah, so it's just, again, bringing that sort of immediate with... Uh, eliminating the password in some ways and, and thinking about how each of our individual biometrics begins to be that sort of key for all of these uh, interactions that we might have. The second example I wanted to talk about here is a little bit closer to home, but I think is interesting, especially as we think about um, walking around and how we sort of interface with um, retail environments and the like. We were we were coming here and Piers mentioned that he forgot his wallet. Um, and we're sort of not quite at the point now where we can go, um, we're not in a cashless society where you don't need credit cards and all of that. Um, 
And so PayPal is beginning to um, think about the wearable feature and that impact on retail. So in this case, um, they've partnered with Samsung with the, the new um, wearable watch that they've developed. And um, on, their, on their campus, in, at their campus Starbucks, and at a, a small number of Jamba Juices sort of around the, the country, I assume most in California, um, you have the ability to, um, number one, order ahead as you enter into the store using uh, Beacon technology. Um, it sends, it recognizes who you are because of your wearable device, sends that to the cashier. Picture of you shows up on the screen, and then you can simply walk up to the counter, they'll hand you your beverage that you've ordered, and then um, you pay simply by saying your name and then walk out the door. So it's really sort of uh, enabling this, this more seamless level of, of interaction in not just our own sort of personal lives, but in the wider context of, of the world as well. So in the future, you can't pretend that you can't. You've forgotten your wallet, you know, expensive date. And then we talk about cloud memory. Uh, memory. We, uh, we were talking before this talk started about GoPro and the caching, all this wonderful live caching that's going on. And we obviously these wearable devices can continue to um, capture our experience. Yeah, and I think I think what's interesting here is it's sort of um, in the same way that we saw this augmenting of our senses. This is in some ways an offloading of some of that as well. Um, not to say that you're going to forget everything that you ever knew and you're just going to have to search for it, but um, it's an interesting way to think about how memory and, and the like begins to become indexed and searchable later on. Oh. I don't mind. Okay. Um, we've done this before. <laughs> um, so th this, ex this, this um, device is Capture. I don't know if you guys have seen this before. It's basically a device that's always on. It's always recording. So... Um, but it's not always saving. So it's forever um, listening to the conversations around you. And at some point, you and I may have a uh, conversation, which actually I think is interesting. Maybe you've told me a new bar. And I can press a button, and it will save the last 60 seconds of my life, of the things I've heard for later. So this is perfect for blackmailing individuals as well. It's all scary. So as we sort of um, have, have talked through um, all of these trends, we've pulled out, and hopefully I will do a good job of explaining, um, some, of these, some of these key takeaways um, in this space and, and what we think is, is, is exciting. Um, this first notion of, of biotech fusion, I think, um, again, is really about that uh, changing nature of how these devices in new ways and, and even begin to fit more seamlessly onto our bodies. So moving from a wearable piece of technology to a shirt to something that, again, is maybe um, embedded and always on or is something that you can sort of um, leave on for longer periods of time and is gathering um, vital information about you as an individual. Um, this next notion of, of a synced lifestyle is really starting to, to think about how all of this information is um, beginning to be uh, captured about us as individuals, is being stored, archived, um, analyzed in different ways, um, starting to provide a level of sort of deeper insight into who we are about our actions and behaviors, um, and, and helping us um, make changes about our lives and, and in some ways hopefully be more in tune with the things that we're, that we're sort of doing on a daily basis. Organic computing is thinking again about that level of interaction that, um, and the relationship that we have with our devices today. So moving away from external um, accessories that are constantly connected and getting more in tune with natural interfaces that uh, allow our devices to respond to us in more natural ways. So thinking even beyond um, sort of physical inputs, but 
um, maybe things like emotion and stress and, and the like and how that um, impacts those. Um, human enhancement, again, is not that um, we're sort of predicting a $6 million man or woman, but um, how these devices begin to um, take our sort of natural abilities and allow us to augment them in different ways. And I think particularly where um, we're looking at sort of differently abled individuals, um, providing them with, with new ways to bring their, uh, their senses up to the level that will allow them to live a more normal uh, lifestyle. Health empowerment, again, pretty straightforward, but um, really sort of putting the hands of uh, that sort of once, um, da data that was once reserved for the medical community more deeply in the hands of uh, us as individuals. In our Future of Health report, we talk about this whole, whole notion of the empowered patient and how um, the, the uh, consumer or the patient in the healthcare system now has a lot more information to go and speak with their doctors and hopefully sort of have a, a more intelligent conversation and really collaborate with them on the best level of treatment. And maybe not even have to get to that level where you're sick or infirmed and can live a more preventative lifestyle in that way. And then finally, this notion of personalized context. So as our devices begin to understand who we are as an individual um, and connect and speak to other connected ecosystems, how that really changes the way that we experience the world around us um, and, and bring this new level of connected experience to uh, our, our daily life. Wonderful. So that, that's an overview of our reports. You know, I, 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 I lo you've heard about, about wearables. You might be even involved in developing new ideas for wearables. I think our job is to just provide a framework for, for you to think about wearables and where things are going. And so hopefully that will help you and inspire you. Thank you very much. Thanks. We can take a question, maybe, or we can run it, yeah? Uh, Hi. Oh, thanks. Um, I just had a quick question about uh, passwords and authenticating. And, you know, like if your, your heartbeat, right, if it's being authenticated, it's being checked against stored data somewhere. And that's the same thing that happens currently with a password. So what would the... Like, what's the benefit of checking a heartbeat when that data can also be, like, uh, I guess, faked? It makes me think of the Robert Redford movie Sneakers when they're like, my voice is my password, authenticate me. So, like, you can do that with anything. So why, like, a heartbeat as opposed to, like, password? Oh, well. Good question. Um, I would say, I think... There's, there's the sort of, there's the fact that, I mean, it's not going to be foolproof, I suppose. Um, and again, I don't know the, I don't know how this technol that particular piece of technology works. I think what it's doing is it's sort of providing an, e an ease of access in that context. Um, the thinking about how I could see that sort of functioning is. For example, in the context of a hospital where doctors may be logging in and out of various workstations around the hospital, um, potentially entering in sensitive patient information and the like, it sort of becomes this quick and easy method for them to um, securely log in and out of those stations without having to, to constantly be going through these repetitive motions all the time. I, you know, not knowing enough about, again, that technology, it's... It's not going to be. It's not going to be foolproof, but it's. It sort of changes that. It changes that relationship, I suppose. Yeah, I think it's a good question. Our job's to kind of show you the, the ideas that are being explored. Some of those are kind of quite. So the some of the the answer to that question probably needs to be answered by the people developing that. But even, even beyond. Sorry. Even beyond the sort of wearable tech space, it's interesting to see the experiments that are taking place now with. Um, there's, we wrote about something on our site recently where it's a piece of technology that allows you to basically hold your 
uh, wrist over a, a reading device, which uses the, the pulses of the blood going through your veins as a way to authenticate who you are as an individual, and they've linked that to a payment system. So, I mean, you know, a lot of these are experiments, and, you know, they haven't, they haven't fully been, been fleshed out yet in that context. Hey, how you doing? Uh, thank you guys for presenting. Um, a lot of the wearables that you showed up there were for the consumer space. I would say a large majority of them. And I was kind of wondering where you guys see wearables going in B2B and large-scale industry. Um, I'll give you two examples that I've seen recently. And um, the first thing is I think Piers mentioned Google Glass obviously has like a lot of limited capabilities, but I think where it's showing a lot of promise is in the context of industry. So either, um, you know, if you can imagine someone in a pick and pack sort of in inventory space, um, having the ability to hands-free track and log a lot of information more instantaneously. In an education setting, Google Glass is being experimented with medical students. So allowing uh, professors to sort of beam their point of view to students or vice versa when they're going through, um, you know, those uh, sort of very intricate uh, levels of uh, techniques. And then um, just yesterday I was reading an article about uh, Salesforce beginning to, and, and I don't know enough of the details right now, but they're beginning to experiment with applications um, for a lot of these um, wrist-worn wearable devices and thinking about how that um, changes the way that uh, individuals are able to tap into the system and use that in different business settings, obviously from a sales point of view and having sort of at, at a glance information that might be more relevant. So, and then as well, um, Evernote is also beginning to experiment with that. So I think it's sort of early days, but um, there's... Do we have, oh, do we have? So I couldn't help but notice that there are social changes that come out of this, right? It's, it's not that we're going to do the 20th or 21st century things with this new technology, but it'll change the way we interact. One that springs to mind is if payment becomes so easy and seamless, when I go to someone's house, am I going to start being expected to pay for things and, and help out with the groceries? Can you guys speak to any sorts of trends and social changes that you see kind of aggregating out of all these wearable technologies? I mean, our classic response to something like that is that, you know, uh, our wants and needs don't change. Our behaviors and expectations do change. So uh, if I was at home, you know, how often do, you, do, do people, when you visit someone's house, how often do they want you or need you to pay money? And I think those things change. But of course, behavior will change. I, I mean, for me, obviously, the big, the big thing is the whole sort of privacy space. Um, and what that means as an individual, I, personally, I'm not comfortable sharing a lot of information about myself um, tapping into these systems. So what's the, what's the sort of privacy settings on the back end that ensure that, you know, who who's, has access to that information, where is it stored? who owns that information, how's it being used. All of those things I think are incredibly interesting. And then obviously, um, you know, in the context of something like Google Glass, that's really changing the relationship between individuals because as soon as you sort of um, have the ability to, or stand in front of someone, you're not exactly sure what's happening in that context. So I think for me, those, the way that those new mores begin to sort of arise as a result of some of these things are going to be really interesting in terms of just those like one-to-one -one interactions.